the rules committee will come to order. Um, today we are discussing something that, um, if finally prioritized, has the potential to help turn America's sick care system into a healthcare system. This meeting system. is being recorded. Food is medicine. Um, it's like what my grandmother used to tell me when I was growing up. Uh, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. It would annoy me when she would say it. I wish she was still alive so I could tell her you were right. Um, but uh, what we eat plays a huge role in our overall health. And when families don't have access to nutritious food, their health suffers. And we've talked a lot about food deserts, communities that lack access to grocery stores with fresh produce, but there are also food swamps. Uh, communities where there is access to fast food and junk food without any nutritious, affordable food. You know, when families don't have access to nutritious food, their health suffers. And, uh, and they fall into a vicious cycle where our health care system today prioritizes treatment instead of prevention. Now, not every uh, hospital and every health center does that, but, but I think we need a system-wide change and how we approach this um, in our healthcare system. You know, we rely on costly hospital visits and expensive prescription drugs instead of addressing the underlying issues that lead to chronic conditions in the first place. Uh, hunger and health are not separate issues. They are two sides of the same coin. Uh, community organizations are doing incredible work all across the country to connect chronically ill patients with the food that they need. And I was in New York City earlier this week and I visited the Institute for Family Health in Manhattan, which is a community health center that truly gets it. They are using food as medicine to bring more equity into the system and end and health disparities. I stopped by and visited uh, Hunter College's Food Policy Center. They've spent two years working on uh, what I think will be a truly groundbreaking report on this topic that they're gonna release in the next uh, couple of months. You know, I'm in Massachusetts with the Friedman School for Nutrition at uh, Tufts University, which is doing, um, you know, incredible research uh, and coming up with incredible recommendations of how we should address this. The Harvard uh, uh, a Center for, uh, um, for Law and Policy Innovation, another uh, entity we've been dealing with. And, and we have the Hunger to Health Collaboratory uh, here in Massachusetts, which is also, uh, I think, on the cutting edge of all of this. but. Um, but this isn't a radical idea. You know, we're not talking pseudoscience here, uh, and we're not talking about limiting uh, what somebody can eat um, or even controlling what people eat. What we're talking about is providing medically, things like we were talking about is, is things like providing medically tailored meals that lower hospital emissions, improve outcomes, save money, and build a more just and equitable healthcare system. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, food prescriptions uh, as a way to, uh, help, you know, treat people so that they don't have to rely as much on expensive, uh, pharmaceuticals. You know, federal policies are decades behind the science on this. And my hope is that, uh, what we hear today gives the White House some perspective on food as medicine. So this can be a major part of an eventual White House conference that we hope to hold next year. I know that HHS and CMS are beginning to uh, really look at this. I've had discussions with them, you know, where they have um, the tools to start standing up these pilots and test programs. They need to do so without delay. Uh, that's something that can change lives very, very quickly. Finally, seeing food as medicine will make real progress in any hunger across the country. Um, so I, um, I, again, um, I, 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 I learned a lot about this issue and the connection between food and medicine uh, over the years um, and in the rules committee as we've been doing hearings and site visits and conversations we've even learned more uh, and uh, I think uh, this is an urgent matter and I want to welcome our witnesses here today as usual our witnesses will give a roughly five minute opening and members are asked to keep their questions to approximately Five minutes as well. Um, I think it will work well the, the last um, uh, hearing we did, and that will allow us to keep today's conversation efficient and meaningful. So now let me welcome our witnesses here today. Um, Barbara Petey um, is the executive director of the Root Cause Coalition. Her focus has been addressing food insecurity and other basic needs so as to um, help develop and lift up sustainable solutions 
that can be scaled and replicated across the nation, thereby improving the health and well-being of individuals and communities. Trenor Williams is a family physician, entrepreneur, former health system executive and consulting leader. He co-founded Socially Determined in order to create an analytics platform that integrates the social determinants of health with clinical and uh, claims data in order to quantify and visualize social risk and the specific impacts on health and healthcare outcomes. Karen Pearl is president and CEO of God's Love We Deliver. God's Love uh, provides food and nutrition services so urgently required uh, by, by those um, living with severe and chronic illnesses. She has grown the organization's food and healthcare policy and advocacy capacity significantly and has led its research projects on HIV, AIDS, cancer, and healthcare cost reduction. I had a great visit there and and it was just really uplifting when all the, a lot of the work everybody's doing here, I mean, with all that's going on in the world, uh, the work that you are all spearheading is quite incredible. Michelle Nishan is a four-time James Beard award-winning chef with over 35 years of leadership advocating for a more healthful, sustainable food system. He is the co-founder and executive chairman of Wholesome Ways, an organization that creates partnerships based programs to enable underserved consumers to make healthier food choices by increasing affordable access to health locally and regionally grown foods. And we have worked together on many things over the years. It's great to see you. Dr. Stephen Chen is the chief medical officer of all in Alameda County in California and brings an integrative health equity uh, lens to all in's work on poverty. He is leading the scale uh, and spread of a food as medicine initiative across Alameda County health clinics, health systems, and food systems. We're grateful that you've joined us today. And finally, Santana Diaz is the director of culinary operations and executive chef of the food and nutrition services at UC Davis Health. Uh, and um, I had a good opportunity to, to visit there as well. And uh, the food landscape at the hospital has been transitioning into a true farm to fork healthy food program since Chef Diaz started there. Uh, visitors, patients, and employees are now able to enjoy locally sourced world-class cuisine menu options thanks to Chef Diaz's inspired vision. Uh, and um, as I said, when I first met him, I mean, some of the worst food in the world is in our hospitals, uh, both as a patient or as somebody who's visiting. Uh, and so I really appreciate his innovation. So again, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Ms. Petey, we will, you are recognized uh, for your testimony and, um, and you may begin. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, members of the committee and guests. My name is Barbara Petey and I serve as both the Executive Director of the Root Cause Coalition and the Chief Advocacy and Government Relations Officer for ProMedica a health and wellness organization based in Northwest Ohio with a national footprint in senior care and healthy aging, as well as work that spans the nation in addressing basic needs that, when lacking, contribute to poor health, commonly referred to as the social determinants. Six years ago, the Root Cause Coalition was co-founded by ProMedica and the AARP Foundation to address the social, social determinants, such as food and housing insecurity, isolation and economic hardships. Today, we're nearly 100 member organizations strong representing healthcare, insurance, business, education, faith communities, social services, local organizations, local government, foundations, food bank, and food assistance organizations. We come from different backgrounds, but share a common goal to achieve health equity for all. In fact, it isn't just a common goal, it's our mission. It's a distinct honor to be with you today to discuss one of the coalition's central principles that hunger is indeed a health issue and that nutrition and food insecurity has deep implications for our individual and public health. It goes without saying that these insecurities broadly contribute to a host of diet related chronic conditions and skyrocketing healthcare costs. As such, recognizing and acknowledging the vital framework that food as medicine plays in competitive combating these inequities is critical to achieving our common goal. COVID-19 has underscored and laid bare that our playing field isn't level. The marginalized and those who struggle daily to make ends meet 
many of whom we've come to know as essential or frontline workers, remain in the margins because the way in which we address these issues has been through a patchwork of programs. To be sure, many organizations, hospitals and health insurers included, have developed incredible programs and models that address the nutrition need of their patients and clients that in turn improve overall health. Many of these organizations are members of root cause, but all of the individual programs collectively cannot do what comprehensive national health policy could do to appropriately ensure that access to nutritious food for all becomes a part of our nation's health delivery model. In fact, recent research from the Root Cause Coalition shows that there is a public will to address it. More than three quarters of Americans say they support hunger as a policy priority. Now we need the political will as well. Our current healthcare delivery model is at an inflection point. Born in a post-World War II era that spurred the building of hospitals and clinics, accelerated the development of medicine, treatments, and technology that made advancements we could not imagine just 75 years ago was and is remarkable. But along the way, we lost our footing and our focus to ensure that individuals, our patients, our neighbors, our fellow citizens had access to the most basic needs that impact health, including nutritious food. We put less focus on access and prevention, and it's led us to a point where on any given day, in cities and communities across our country, the most amazing advances can save lives, while too many others wither and experience unimaginable consequences, even death, due to lack of nourishing food and other basic necessities. And so often, access to these basic necessities is tied to income, education, and race. In 2021, it should not be the case that your zip code determines your health and how long you live. That's just wrong. You'll hear from others on the panel this afternoon about the work they're doing in their organizations across communities and across the nation, and how the lives of hundreds of thousands of individuals have been improved because of their thoughtful approach to addressing hunger. I've had the great privilege to work with most of them, and some are also members of the Root Cause Coalition. For example, ProMedica builds and operates a grocery store in a food desert to ensure equitable access to healthy food for residents who live in an inner city neighborhood. A veggie mobile serves both the inner city and rural communities, and our food clinic has proven to reduce readmissions and improve overall health of those who are given a prescription for food to supplement their diet, also reducing the need for medicine as well. ProMedica, Presbyterian Health System, and so many hospitals across the country screen their patients for food and security, and make appropriate community connections to ensure that needs are met. Insurers are equally committed. For example, Kaiser Permanente is one of the insurers that is taking a closer look at how interventions promoting food as medicine can improve health outcomes and decrease costs. They are actively evaluating interventions such as medically tailored meals and produce prescriptions to understand what works and under what conditions. I encourage this committee to engage with all insurers to understand their current efforts, questions, and challenges that they face. Our non-clinical members, especially food banks, who work in communities with hospitals, insurers, schools, and other organizations are helping forge the way. But we can't fix our nation's healthcare model one pilot at a time. One of our key priorities as a coalition is to advocate for the reforms that include metrics and new payment models in Medicare and Medicaid that address health and equity and ensure payment to care providers and non-clinical community-based organizations for demonstrated value related to addressing the social determinants. That's the model that we can and must build together. We must address health outside of traditional medicine. We must address health before medicine because food is medicine. In closing, I'd like to thank you, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and every member of the committee for your focus on this issue. As we all know, the American people have been through so much recently, but the Root Cause Coalition shares your sense of obligation and understands that any healing from this period cannot be a return to normal. The normal that was pre-COVID was not acceptable. We must do better. Collectively, we believe we can. I thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for your excellent testimony. I now turn to Dr. Williams. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and the entire Rules Committee and guests for allowing myself and uh, my esteemed colleagues 
to participate in the conversation today on such an important topic. Um, as you said, I'm a family physician. I'm also the son of a social worker uh, and the CEO of Socially Determined. I think I sit at the center of food and medicine in the work that I, that I get to do. Over the last five years, our company has built an analytic platform that allows us to quantify, measure, calculate social risk, food insecurity, housing instability, transportation barriers, financial strain um, at a community and at a person level. And we have the great privilege of partnering with health systems, health insurance companies, nonprofit organizations as they support the people uh, that they care for to be able to identify and quantify social risk, quantify the impact that it's actually having on health and healthcare outcomes, help prioritize the interventions and actions that take place and importantly, measure that return to the impact that that happens out there. I wanted to talk today about data uh, and specifically talk about some of the myths or misconceptions and not suggesting in any way that this committee has misconceptions about it, but I think it's important as we think about the industry. The first of which is that we don't have enough data to understand food insecurity. And the really good news is that's not true. Um, there is a wealth of data, and frankly, we have a business because we're able to work within the construct of available data to provide insights to those customers and partners that we work with. The hard part for food insecurity is there's not just one source. We cannot go to the USDA and identify a person that is food insecure. It doesn't exist. So fortunately, though, there is publicly available data, open public data at a federal and state level that provides important information from demographics, to USDA and CDC and census data. There's business data that is available so that you can understand where every full service grocery store, food bank, and as you talked about food swamps, fast food restaurants are in the country to get a context of what's going on in communities. There's person level data from organizations like TransUnion um, that provide individual level data in the context of care or management so we can understand the financial, housing, transportation challenges that a person has, and certainly our healthcare partners that have clinical and claims data about utilization. We and other folks like us use that information to quantify and understand risk exposure. So based on where I live, what's my risk for food insecurity based on the assets, attributes, resources in a given community? And you can think about that like living in a food desert. When you combine that with the next layer down of social risk, so now based on my own personal situation, financial, housing, transportation, et cetera, what's my risk for food insecurity? And thirdly, importantly, in a time dependent way, that transition from risk to social need. So at the end of the month, when I run out of money and I understand that I don't have enough money to put healthy food on my table, there is data available from all those sources that I talked about and the patients or people themselves to be able to quantify that social risk. That's the first myth. The second is that food insecurity is an isolated problem, that it occurs by itself, and that is fundamentally not true. It commonly occurs, and we see it along with transportation risk, with financial strain, with housing instability. And in fact, when we calculate food insecurity at a person and community level, we're looking at data like, does a person own a car? Do they live in a viable transportation, reliable transportation network? How much income after they pay for housing do they have disposable to be able to pay for food? All of these things become incredibly important, and it's the multifactorial nature of risk that becomes important that we actually address. Third myth is that food insecurity is the same for everybody, that the cause of food insecurity is the same. And again, we know that that's not true. We actually look at the drivers of risk and think about items such as affordability, availability of healthy food options, and food literacy. And there's the data that exists to be able to quantify those differences and that matters so much because as we think about interventions that will have real impact on the ground um, we might think differently if there's availability of healthy food and may need a medically tailored meal program versus if it's affordability and it's a produce prescription that actually matters on the ground to be able to solve um, that need last thing and uh, miss pd uh, was kind enough to talk about as well is that intersection that food insecurity isn't a healthcare problem. And again, we know that is not true. Um, when we look at clinical or claims data sets from whether that's a Medicaid population, a commercial population, Medicare Advantage, so across all different demographics um, and dynamics of populations and individuals, we consistently see that food insecurity is linked 
to challenges with utilization, whether that's avoidable emergency medicine utilization, avoidable hospitalization, uh, and avoidable readmissions um, as part of that. We see significant impacts related to diet associated illnesses such as diabetes and heart failure. And as organizations, health systems, and health plans move into more value-based care across the country, we see huge opportunity to better understand that risk and link social risk tied to those programs and better understand, again, exactly how to address uh, that. Um, as part of that, in the interest of time, um, I would say that we're fortunate that we're able to work with organizations such as, as ProMedica, um, as organizations like DC Greens right here in DC, uh, Congresswoman Norton, um, as part of that with health plans such as Care First, um, with Capital Area Food Bank, to support a range of programs that work. The great news is that there is no shortage of evidence that food insecurity directly impacts healthcare cost utilization and equity. There's also a wealth of programs, and we'll hear so much more today about programs that are designed um, and leverage the idea of food as medicine to address those risks. That being said, there are key barriers um, that, that exist today that we see preventing the industry from being able to effectively address those issues at scale. Just two. One, the need for more systematic and importantly equitable strategies for proactively identifying risk of food insecurity, which is a big part of what we try to do. Waiting for patients to come through our door or members to call is insufficient um, at best. We can and should do better. Um, and there are a range of policy options that, that might help enable that. Lastly, there's clear need for more direct flexible funding to support sustained implementation and evaluation of these programs. We need to advance beyond short-term pilots and philanthropically funded programs and build more scalable, sustainable solutions that are truly embedded within the healthcare delivery and payment ecosystem. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for the time. Greatly appreciate it. Look forward to answering questions later. Well, thank you very much. And uh, again, just like it was Petey's testimony, I mean, I, I think this is, uh, I think your testimony was uh, right on target. I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, I want to now yield to Ms. Pearl. Uh, but before I do, I, I want to just say, uh, I think it goes for everybody on the panel, but I, I did visit, God, visit God's Love We Deliver. Um, I, 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 I've known Chef Nishan for a, a long time, and I just met Chef Diaz. Not not uh, not too long ago with Congressman Garamendi out in California, but one of the things I appreciate about everybody on this panel is that when we're talking about, you know, food as medicine, we're talking about making sure people who struggle get food. The attitude is that the kind of food I want to make sure that people have who struggle uh, is the same food that I would want for me or my family. Um, and you know, I did a tour of God's Love We Deliver. The food looks so good. I asked if there was a re if there were recipes available, and I got a recipe book. Uh, so um, you know, I can now cook as good as they do. Uh, well, not quite, but anyway. Uh, but it was really. Um, but I, I think that you know, too often in the past, we have not approached this issue, understanding that the people uh, that need our help, you know, need to be treated with dignity, and it's not just take this. Um, it is. Uh, it is, it is, it is, to me, food is love, food is respect, food is joy, as well as being medicine and health. So, um, so everybody on this panel, um, I think, shares that view. But let me now yield to Ms. Pearl. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for those kind words about God's love we deliver. Uh, it is really my uh, great honor to have been invited here by the chairman today and also to all members of the rules committee. I thank you for the honor of being able to present to you. I will begin by laying out the following proposition. We will never reach our health care goals of improving health outcomes, lowering costs and creating equitable access without fully integrating the medically tailored meal intervention into health care. I know that's bold but I will tell you why. But first, let me introduce myself. I am Karen Pearl, President and CEO of God's Love We Deliver. God's Love is a non-sectarian, nonprofit provider of medically tailored meals, or as we like to say, MTM, in New York City and the surrounding counties. Each year, we deliver more than 2.5 million meals to over 10,000 people living with over 200 different critical illnesses like HIV, 
cardiovascular disease, cancer, renal failure, and so many more. We support families by feeding the children and caregivers of our severely ill clients, and we deliver to our community with the help of 17,000 volunteers. Our signature difference is nutrition, with eight registered dietitian nutritionists on staff. We partner with many healthcare plans and hospitals to integrate this life-saving intervention into the care continuum. I'm also the chair of the Food is Medicine Coalition, or FIMIC, a national coalition of nonprofits delivering medically tailored meals, nutrition counseling, and education. Last year, FIMIC agencies cooked and home delivered 11 million meals to over 48,000 people across multiple states in the District of Columbia. Today, I speak from both the God's love and the FIBIC perspective. The impact of the medically tailored meal model has gained much attention recently, but the concept is not new. God's love started over 35, 35 years ago at the height of the AIDS pandemic, when one woman delivered groceries to a man who was dying of AIDS. She came back the next day and the groceries were still on the counter. She had an epiphany. People in this state of illness do not need only food. They need nutritious meals that are prepared for their unique circumstances and home delivered to their doors. For this population, a meal is the difference between life and death. And thus, a movement was born. Nutrition science has been the focus of our mission since the beginning when we started our nutrition department staffed by registered dietitian nutritionists that helps individuals combat wasting early on and then manage medication and side effects and now eat right for so many of their multiple diagnoses. In 2001, we saw the need in our community and God's love expanded our mission to serve people living with all, with all severe and chronic illnesses. And today, most of our clients are living with multiple diagnoses. In fact, 42% live with four or more illnesses at once. So our clients have complex dietary restrictions and medical conditions that make it impossible for them to take advantage of traditional emergency food systems. For the acute population that is driving so much of the cost of healthcare today, adding something as fundamental as a meal tailored for their specific medical circumstances can turn their situation around. Medically tailored meals are more than a meal. They are an intervention designed by registered dietitian nutritionists and chefs and recommended in partnership with healthcare providers. The intervention includes a rigorous dietary assessment and individualized medical nutrition therapy. Meals are cooked from scratch in our kitchen with no preservatives, starters, or fillers, glass chilled, flash frozen to preserve flavor and then home delivered to clients. Our meals have to be delicious and visually appealing. And I thank you again, Chairman, for the compliment because appetite is one of the first things that go when people are sick. As our executive chef says, our food is medicine, but it doesn't have to taste like medicine. While access to food is a social determinant, medically tailored meals is an evidence-based proven intervention with robust research behind it. The value proposition for MTM is pretty simple. MTMs are associated with reduction in emergency department visits by 70%, reduction in hospital admissions by 52%, reduction in admission to nursing facilities by 72%, and a 16% net decrease in healthcare costs. It is because of these types of outcomes that early on in the HIV pandemic, the Ryan White HIV program chose a whole person approach, including food and nutrition services alongside medical and pharmaceutical support. Ryan White remains the only dedicated federal funding stream for MTMs, yet still does not cover all of those who come to us in need. Access to MTMs is largely funded through private philanthropy across the country, resulting in system-wide gaps. MTMs are not a reimbursable benefit for employees in state Medicaid, for enrollees in state Medicaid programs, and Medicare covers only a small portion of enrollees at the discretion of plans. 
yet because of the compelling research results, some states and managed care plans have begun to use waivers and regulatory flexibilities to pilot coverage of MTMs. All of this, pilots and research are demonstrating that MTM and medical nutrition therapy work, and they work in different settings, with different illnesses, and with all different demographics. While much success has been seen in these pilots, they remain on the margins of innovation and fall short of establishing the widespread coverage needed to ensure equitable access across the US. Changing healthcare policy to fund, deliver, and explicitly evaluate the MTM intervention in Medicare and Medicaid would solve this issue. And we are grateful that last year, Mr. McGovern and other members of the bipartisan Food is Medicine Working Group introduced a bill such as that will move us in that direction, the Medically Tailored Home Delivered Meal Demonstration Pilot Act of 2020, which would establish a multi-state Medicare pilot as well as provide outcomes data needed to build a more resilient and cost-effective health system. So the time is now to change the healthcare landscape and to make MTM a recognized benefit in all healthcare plans, including Medicaid, Medicare, and private insurance. During the COVID pandemic, the gaps in equity and access for people who need quality food and nutrition was laid bare. A person's diet often has life and death consequences. And when people are severely ill, good nutrition is the first thing to deteriorate, making recovery that much harder, if not impossible. Early and reliable access to medically tailored meals helps individuals live healthy and productive lives and produces all of the changes that we want to see in our system. I hope you will join me in the effort to ensure that MTM are part of the solution to improving health, lowering healthcare costs, and ending malnutrition and hunger in America. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate uh, your testimony. And now I turn this over to Chef Michelle Nishan. Uh, uh, thank, I think I unmuted myself. Uh, ma many thanks, Chairman McGovern and, and distinguished members of the Committee on Rules. Uh, I'm Michelle Nishan, a chef and co-founder and executive chairman at Wholesome Wave. And I thank you for holding this event and for inviting all of us uh, to participate in this important discussion and conversation. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Um, has your doctor ever told you to eat more fruits and vegetables? Probably, I know, I know that mine has, uh, but until now, doctors really could only provide the advice without the resources to act on it, which is a huge distinction, especially if you're struggling with low income. When uh, the late Gus Schumacher and I founded Wholesome Wave in the basement of my restaurant, uh, we, we rely on really one simple belief, and that's the power of fruits and vegetables to change and improve lives. As simple as it sounds, it's absolutely true. Uh, as a chef and a father of two children living with type 1 diabetes, uh, I've learned about that power and really wanted to figure out a way to make the lifestyle changes necessary that were accessible to me and my family, like choosing and eating more fruits and vegetables, available to all families, regardless of their struggles with low income or poverty. Uh, our core value really and core belief is that everybody, regardless of race, ethnicity, age, or income, has the right to feed themselves and their families well, and that they want to. Uh, Wholesome Wave's been working on nutrition insecurity and learning these things to be true through nutrition incentive programs tied to SNAP since 2007. Our focus on food has a powerful prevention option, and healthcare really began in 2010 in Massachusetts um, when I first learned about a trial program in Ypsilanti, Michigan, uh, where a health center was offering $5 fruit and vegetable prescription vouchers on these kitschy little prescription pads that were redeemable at the local farmer's market um, for fruits and vegetables in an aim to increase low-income community members' access to local fruits and vegetables. Uh, we believed in the power of food as medicine is very real, so we started engaging with iterating and nationally expanding these program models uh, to really help highlight that connection and achieve a proof of concept for good nutrition as a form of diet-related disease prevention and management. 
Uh, we've, we've reached thousands and thousands of patients in dozens of states and territories from Codman to Crenshaw, Skowhegan to Chicago, and Washington, D.C. to the Navajo Nation. The one thing that we've learned in all of these places, regardless of urban, rural, territorial, they work. Uh, today, Wholesome Wave continues to address nutrition insecurity by developing and deploying programs, platforms, and seed funding to support community-rooted health organizations in their efforts to address this horrible lack of affordability and lack of access to healthy food across the country. And the outcomes of this work and evidence derive our essential considerations for both food and health policy. Our, our, our programs were also to prove to, uh, designed to prove that uh, good food is good health and good business. Uh, the redemption of produce prescriptions at farmers markets and local grocers have increased sales and income for both farmers, retailers, their support service supply chain partners, but also provided robust full community engagement at these vital neighborhood markets so that the markets actually look like the entire community, except uh, instead of just for those who could afford to participate. In the years since, we've launched numerous programs across the country and expanded the delivery model to federally qualified health centers, public hospitals, community-based clinics, and more. And we've expanded the redemption options to include large-scale grocery stores, community-supported agriculture programs, mobile markets, even online food order and delivery. This approach is now a real movement spearheaded by healthcare and community-based organizations in rural, urban, and, and tribal communities alike. Uh, to date, we've identified over 100 active programs at several hundred sites throughout the country, many of which are represented by our National Produce Prescription Collaborative. The MPPC is uh, an organized collective to support and leverage produce prescription programs and practices as prevention and intervention for diet-related disease uh, through policy and by further embedding these models into healthcare and community food systems. Uh, as my colleagues on this panel all have confirmed and will continue to, uh, the impacts of these programs have been impressive and warrant serious consideration by all who wish to improve the health and the lives of vulnerable Americans in a cost-effective way. These programs have been the subject of over 30 studies and peer-reviewed scientific and economic journals just in the last five years. All have consistently reported on the power of produce prescriptions to improve intake of fruits and vegetables, improve overall dietary consumption, reduce the gap between actual consumption and the national daily recommendations, imagine that, uh, lower weight, lower blood pressure, and lower hemoglobin A1C, the key biometric indicator used in diagnosing diabetes and its preconditions. What doesn't show up in these studies, uh, but I and all of my colleagues know to be true uh, from personal experience is the joy and the dignity factor that these programs create to the Congressman's earlier comments. With the rapid uptake and promising results of these programs across the country, our priority is simple. Establish that body of evidence that demonstrates the value of produce prescription programs and medically tailored meals in improving health outcomes, customer experience, and improving the overall health care system. We spend $100,000 per patient just on dialysis for one year for a patient. 377,000 Americans will be on dialysis this year at a cost of $49 billion. That's a lot of fruits and vegetables. In this vein, we support a CMMI pilot at CMS, which includes produce prescriptions as a treatment lever and an innovative value-based care, value care model. Uh, CMS continues to seek ways to better understand how to systematically identify and respond to the health-related social needs of Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries in order to, to reduce total health care costs and create better health outcomes. Our experience confirms that produce prescriptions help facilitate and accomplish these goals in a cost-effective way. Additionally, we'd love to see produce prescriptions integrated into federal programs such as Medicare and Medicaid in a sustainable and consistent way, specifically by providing a produce prescription benefit to cover produce and services for members with diagnosed diet-related conditions who have challenges accessing nutritious and affordable food. Again, Congressman, 
and committee, we, we appreciate your tremendous work, your commitment to our country, uh, and for covering this important and powerful issue. Look forward to a fruitful discussion and many, many thanks for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chen. Chair McGovern, distinguished members of the committee and guests, thank you for the opportunity to speak today regarding Alameda County's All In Food as Medicine Initiative. My name is Dr. Stephen Chen, and I am an integrative family medicine doctor and the chief medical officer of All In Alameda County in California, where I lead a local food as medicine initiative called Recipe for Health. My story as a physician is not unique. I came to medicine deeply influenced by my immigrant family from Taiwan, where my grandfather was a farmer with a third grade education. While studying to become a physician 26 years ago, I was not trained on how to use food as medicine to help my patients. Then and now, I was limited to one-on-one, 15-minute -on -one, visits that often felt rushed. I flirted with burnout, frustration, and helplessness. I reflected on how my grandfather was connected to the food, to the soil, and ultimately the land. After becoming a community health center medical director, I was empowered to shape the system to be more responsive to what my patients were asking for. I designed different models of care centered around food, not just for nourishment, but also for treatment, prevention, and dare I say, reversal of chronic disease. It was this space that planted the seed for the intervention we developed in Alameda called Recipe for Health. Now, here is what we are all up against and what COVID continues to reveal to us. Number one, an unhealthy diet is the leading cause of death in our country. It's surpassing tobacco use, high blood pressure, and obesity. Number two, chronic disease is afflicting over a third of the country. Number three, food insecurity is worsening and increases the likelihood of developing chronic disease. These three triangulate around each other and are worsened because they have a disproportionate impact on communities of color. Alameda County's Food as Medicine program, Recipe for Health, aims to address these issues through health system transformation. It has three components that come together like a sandwich with two buns and a protein in the middle. So this is the model. Protein in the middle is a health clinic, each of the federally qualified health centers, where we train doctors and other healthcare staff on how to use produce prescriptions to treat chronic conditions and how to screen for food insecurity. We develop all the workflow integration to make this feasible and implementable in the clinics. So it's not just a pie in the sky idea, it's actually effective and doable in the clinic environment. The top button of this sandwich is what we call our food pharmacy. This food pharmacy fills the food produce prescriptions written by the providers. Prior to COVID, this food pharmacy was a farm stand located in the health center waiting room. Since COVID, we've transformed the food pharmacy to a distribution system delivering produce bags from the farm to the doorsteps of patients' homes weekly for 16 weeks. A bag of regeneratively grown food, 16 servings for 16 weeks each week. The bottom bun of this sandwich model is what we call our behavioral pharmacy, which is a group medical visit that brings together 12 to 24 patients at the same time with various medical conditions, diabetes patients next to patients with high blood pressure, next to patients with heart failure, with depression. They all come together to receive nutritional and behavioral support from health coaches and a medical provider. These medical visits uh, occur and patients exercise, they learn about food through demonstrations, practice stress reduction and socially connect in small groups. They talk with their health coaches weekly through texts and phone calls. All of this behavioral and nutritional coaching and support amplify the effect of this healthy food, this medical, what we call medically supportive food on disease treatment. This recipe for health model is integrated into a larger systems change effort known as the circular food economy, which includes pesticide-free regenerative farming to supply our produce prescriptions, food recovery efforts in the county, and employment opportunities for, formerly, for folks who were formerly in the justice system, formerly incarcerated. 
our preliminary findings of this model for food and behavioral pharmacy show the following. A 77% reduction in days in the hospital and in the emergency room. A 16 point reduction in blood pressure. A 35 to 38% reduction in measures of depression and anxiety. A 25% reduction in food insecurity during a pandemic, which actually increased food insecurity by 200%. The major barriers to scaling innovative programs like these and those around the country are twofold. First, food as medicine is relatively new to many healthcare providers and clinics are not all set up to implement this. So there's a need for capacity building and technical assistance. And I'm happy to talk more about that during the discussion on that. Second, this work is largely funded by a combination of public and private grants which poses challenges for long-term sustainability, sustainability. And you heard this from other members of the committee. There are promising efforts to integrate food as medicine into healthcare system through Medicaid waivers, such as happening in Massachusetts, North Carolina, Oregon, and similar efforts happening right now in California. However, we really need to explore moving beyond Medicaid waivers to make these food as medicine services fully covered health insurance benefits. Imagine the day that your healthcare provider can prescribe these food as medicine and nutritional and behavioral support uh, programs to treat, prevent, and reverse your diabetes. Imagine the day when this type of medicine is covered by your health insurance, just like your blood pressure medications. When this day arrives, food as medicine interventions will be fully integrated into the healthcare system across rural, suburban, and urban America. This can be our reality. Thank you again for making space for this important discussion. We in Alameda County are ready to partner and support the larger efforts that you are leading. I look forward to our discussion and happy to take any questions at that time. Thank you. Thank you very much much, Doctor. Uh, and now our, our final witness is Chef Diaz. Uh, thank you for being here and uh, you are recognized. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairman McGovern, uh, Rules Committee uh, and guests. Um, when we collaborate on one of the most important opportunities of our time, uh, we can truly work uh, to right the ship. Uh, this unhealthy path that many people are on may not have been on purpose, but rather points to educational opportunities surrounding the importance of clean, healthy foods. It's about nutrition security. Um, so over the last uh, four years, UC Davis Health has been transitioning to or transitioning its food nutrition services food program to a true farm to fork, farm to table, uh, patient care education platform. Um, where else will we as community members receive examples of healthy, clean foods? Healthcare facilities should be using the three meals a day as a true intervention opportunity, educate uh, while within our care. Uh, using minimally processed foods with minimal preservatives and additives uh, to provide true nutrition security not just fillers. Um, we focus on source transparency for a multitude of reasons. We want to help identify an opportunity to create, capture true data to help support a food system that endorses nutrition and potentially reduces food-related healthcare readmissions into hospitals. Most people are, you know, the stigma of healthcare food uh, is, is real. And so that provides another side of things with sustainability. If the food that healthcare systems are providing is not even consumed, it's just a very expensive waste program. A food nutrition services program is uh, currently recognized by Healthcare Without Harm and Practice Green Health as a top 10 local and sustainable healthcare procurement strategy plan in the nation. Uh, you heard from many colleagues on this call regarding medically tailored meals which we too are addressing within our, within our arms of the food program is important. Um, good food is good medicine. You know, it's not necessarily about just another pill. This is a true team and collaborative effort 
Our Food and Nutrition Services Department work with the Centers uh, for Precision Medicine, our Center for Precision Nutrition, Center for Healthcare Policy and Research, our Department of Nutrition on our uh, UC Davis campus, um, Health Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, and actually many more. Um, it's not just about the food, it's, I mean, it is about the food, but we have to make sure we have the right uh, components and the right people and the players to actually make the change happen. Engagement in this true focus on food as medicine has caught the attention of our California Department of Food and Agriculture, the support of data collection surrounding specialty crop grants and procurement. Um, our hospital food is acting as a, an anchor institution yielding community benefits on a multitude of levels, including local investment dollars, food education, and the promotion of nutrition practices. We are trying to address behavioral change, right? Which is really the most difficult thing. How do you get it into the home? Uh, we look to source from local regional, uh, from our regional farmers and ranchers, and it's supported um, by our UC Davis Health Executive Leadership. That, support needs to happen, right? And it's costing dollars, but we're actually testing it and piloting this now to show the, the proof of concept. Although our data is uh, that's being recorded by the precision medicine and uh, precision nutrition teams are is raw, we anticipate that this data will provide measures to scale for institutions with promotions, uh, with, with promising logistical processes. So we're actually looking at Aside from us being an institution, working with the schools and looking at their institutional procurement as well, and trying to tie it all in together, because we know that by the time you in, enter a healthcare facility, uh, it's it's too late. You're diagnosed with a problem. If we can address it at the on the school age level, you would say a farm to school program or something of that through nutrition. That's what can really help. And so we can address it in the beginning and possibly in the end, and everything in between. <clears throat> if we cannot look, again, if we cannot look at a hospital for healthy, clean food to provide nutrition to our bodies and for our bodies, where else do we turn to? What other industry is actually helping us? Right? So one of the main things in Norma to keep it short was, was keeping it simple. You know, food is medicine. Uh, it is possible to integrate into our systems. And uh, we just need that support to keep this great work by our colleagues going. I thank you, Chairman, Rules Committee, and guests for this opportunity to present uh, to you our ever evolving food program here from UC Davis Health. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you to the entire panel. Um, you know, my advice to the White House is, is if they're listening, just do everything you just said, uh, and we can, you know, move on. Uh, but I'm going to I'm going to go last. Uh, I'm going to recognize people that as, in the order they got here. So we're doing Ms. Scanlon, uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, uh, and Deborah Ross, and then me. Uh, so um, let me yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon. Thank you, Chairman McGovern, and thanks to all of our witnesses for being here for this conversation today. You know, earlier this summer, Chairman McGovern and I toured MANA in Philadelphia. And it's a member of the Food is Medicine and Root Cause Coalitions and an organization whose dietitians, chefs, drivers, and thousands of volunteers cook and deliver medically tailored meals at no cost to clients battling illnesses. Like God's Love We Deliver, MANA's efforts first started to serve people with HIV AIDS. Um, the MANA program was born in a basement of a local church in 1990, but it's since expanded and we've toured their amazing facilities in Philadelphia. And now they treat others with serious illnesses like renal disease, cardiac disease, and diabetes. You know, we know our country spends a huge amount of its annual healthcare dollars on people with one or more chronic health conditions. And we know that we can use in part nutrition to prevent and treat many of the most common chronic conditions like hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, and osteoporosis. But we know that a lot of the times patients aren't able to follow through on doctor prescribed diets all on their own. So the evidence we've seen from programs like MANA in Pennsylvania is that medically tailored meals can be an effective healthcare intervention that leads to improved health outcomes and reduced care utilization. 
So we have data that shows that MANA clients have reduced inpatient admissions and ER visits after starting that program. Um, Ms. Pearl, MANA's had a lot of success in partnerships with Pennsylvania's Medicaid insurers. And they've talked to me about the need to incorporate medically tailored meals into Medicare and Medicaid as a fully covered benefit. Can you talk about why that's important? I'm sorry, that was directed to Ms. Pearl. You have to, you have to unmute. Gotcha. Thank you. I thought that that was happening through the office. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to, to talk about that. So MANA is one of our great colleagues. We really appreciate all the work they've done, not only the service work, but the research work that they've done. And really everything that um, MANA has discovered through their research supports the findings that I just mentioned earlier in my testimony. And it's important that being that medically tailored meals get in, incorporated into Medicare and Medicaid, because what we do is we serve the people who are least able to take care of themselves and who need the good nutrition to heal, to get better, to stay in their homes out of costly places like nursing homes or hospitals, um, and to be able to manage their illness, their medications, and um, just do better and better from a health perspective. And you heard all of my colleagues here, many of whom we are in coalition with, and we are really grateful for that, talk about the different effects of good food and nutrition. And if we were to be able to invest in, if, if Medicaid and Medicare were able to invest in medically tailored meals and many of the other interventions that you heard about, we would see those kinds of research findings on the national level. We'd see enormous healthcare costs savings. Um, we'd see enormously improved health outcomes, whether that is in lab reports or whether that is less use utilization, any number of different um, outcomes. And we would see happier people who were doing better and in their homes. And overall, the whole system benefits. We have fewer people living with severe and chronic illness. We have, um, you know, more and more people um, having, uh, as as we just heard from Dr. Chen, having those kinds of illnesses reverse. And so um, everybody wins and there's absolute, and it is a cost savings. And I keep coming back to that because there's the improved health benefit and there's the lowered cost. It's not something that, it is the most cost effective way of improving the overall healthcare system. And we should be doing it. We, I mean, Mr. Governor just said we should, you know, let's just do it all. Absolutely. We will have a much improved healthcare system and we will have a much, much healthier population, both at the individual and the population level. Um, and we will have money in our system to do other things that we all want to do. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, that penny wise pound foolish thing. We keep getting hung up on that with government. Um, Dr. Chen, I think um, you submitted as part of your testimony, the um, report on mainstreaming produce prescriptions. Um, and I was really interested, particularly in recommendation 18 about supporting healthy food retailers in low income and marginalized communities. I mean, that's a big issue in my district. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what we can do in Congress to increase access to nutritious food, particularly in urban food deserts? Thank you very much for the question, Representative Scanlon. Uh, to increase access to food in urban districts requires supporting a landscape of who the food vendors are. Right? So there's the food vendors, the delivery of the, serve, of the food, but also to go one level below. Where do, where do these food vendors get the food? How are they sourcing the food? And so that's where, if we move into urban farming, urban agriculture in those dense areas, that's a possibility, or just connecting to other local food sources. I do think we are moving though from hunger to nutrition to, or from hunger to food insecurity, nutrition insecurity, because of the recognition, it's not just about any kind of food. It's to your earlier points, like the chair said, it has to be delicious food. And it's not only just delicious food, but it has to be healthful food. And uh, that is why when I hear the chairman talking about a conference that brings the USDA together with the CMS, 
and policymakers, that's where we begin to have these conversations to map out how do we actually do this? How do we increase the food vendors and support them with policy? How do we also ask the question, where does this food come from? And not necessarily go to a race to the bottom where it's only about the getting as cheap of the food as possible because ultimately we pay for that later, as you said earlier. We uh, suffer the, the consequences of cheap food that's low quality, that leads to our diabetes, leads to our obesity, leads to our hypertension. Thank you for that. And, and I think that does talk, speak to the chairman's interest in getting a cross agency um, round table together, because I, I see, saw that your, um, I think it's table 16 talks about the various federal supports for increasing um, access to healthy food in these food deserts, and it crosses um, USDA, HHS, Department of the Treasury, Housing and Urban Development, Small Business Administration. I mean, putting together the things we need to build that infrastructure for healthy food. Um, you know, we've been pretty interested. We've had some innovative programs here in Pennsylvania through the Food Trust and other groups and pushing um, farm markets into food deserts, that kind of thing. But um, clearly, there's a lot that we still need to do. Um, can you, Dr. Chen, also just talk about your organization offers training to providers and healthcare staff on how to use food as medicine. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, we'd be happy to. Let me just start with the baseline. As I said, 26 year ago, years ago, I never got received any training on how to use food as medicine skillfully in a clinical encounter with my patients. And sadly, when I talk to uh, residents now, young residents now, it's the same. 26 years later, there's little educational change there. So it's one thing to have food available in our healthcare systems. It's the other to skillfully use it. And so what we've embarked on here in Alameda County is partnering with a colleague of mine, a number of colleagues of mine who are chef MDs and myself, and we've designed a curriculum uh, that is practical, evidence-based, and takes a variety of approaches to the spectrum of food as medicine interventions. You've heard today from Karen about medically tailored meals. We've heard from Michelle around produce prescriptions. We have other parts of that spectrum of medically supportive food and nutrition approaches that are springing up across the country. We take a look at this, the evidence, and we've designed uh, trainings on how to do this. It's, it's phenomenal to hear the results from our, our staff who hear about this because we're going through each of the clinics and teaching the different staff members. In the beginning, there's sometimes resistance. Why do I need to learn about this? How do I use this? I don't have time. But as we actually train to make it practical and accessible, it's not only the joy of the food for the patients, it's the joy of the practice of medicine. Because now you are able to train yourself to see the prevention end, the treatment end, and the reversal end in using the variety of food elements and spectrum of food interventions to adjust physiology and create health and move away from pathophysiology. Thank you for that. And um, thank you to all of our panelists today. It's, it's really amazing work that you're doing. We really appreciate your sharing with us. And with that, I yield back. Before I, I think uh, Dr. William, you had your hand, were you trying to get our attention? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and Representative Scanlon, thank you for the question. I, just, I thought I'd add on maybe one of the educational components. I think about a program that's being run here in the district led by an organization, DC Greens an amazing food justice organization. But the, the education piece, in addition to working with federally qualified healthcare centers and the clinic and providers, and it's a program in support of individuals with diabetes and hypertension, they get prescribed a prescription for $80 of fruits and vegetables. They can do $20 a week, up to $80 a month. It gets called into Giant, um, which is the only full service grocery store, unfortunately, in the area. Uh, they go and get a nutritional consult that's there as part of that. And then they can redeem and continue to renew that prescription every three months. But the educational component that I found most interesting is, is that it's the providers at the FQHC and the care team. It's Amera Health, which happens to be the health insurance company that is part of this, that has leaned in. It is Giant and their employees that are part of it. It's DC Greens and, and leading the way, and it's the DC government, DC Healthcare Finance. So it's five different organizations collaborating, right, around one common cause. And it's not 
only the education that this is important, but it's the education and how to actually do it and drive results. So almost a 50%, 49% reduction uh, in BMI, a 44% uh, reduction in their hemoglobin A1C during that program. So real results tied to that. I, I, I think that sounds amazing and the collaboration is fabulous, but what struck me about it was an $80 prescription. I mean, that just blew my mind. So, and to get that kind of return on an $80 prescription. Thank That's, you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to yield to uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to. I hope you can hear me. Uh, I, I, I particularly want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the work you've been doing on ending homeless uh, hunger, sorry, in America. Uh, and on going with me, if you will recall, to visit one of our witnesses, which I'm pleased to note today, Dr. Williams, who was working on a produce, uh, produce prescription project in a grocery store in a low-income ward in my district, Ward 8. Uh, here is a picture of, of, of when uh, you, Mr. Chairman, uh, circulated in my district. This is at a giant store here in the District of Columbia. Uh, and I'm so pleased that you went with me to that that store. And so, in this in 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 uh, uh, this uh, roundtable, we've been hearing about how food is essential for overall health. Uh, I did a little research before coming on and found that more than half a million deaths each year in our country can be attributed to an unhealthy diet. Now we've just had a global pandemic, which only increases the importance of nutrition, particularly since so many were lacking during this period. My own district has a huge obesity rate of 24% uh, and something we'd like to do something about. Let me ask a, a question. Um, if people are not informed of their options, uh, it, the notion of access to healthy foods uh, won't have the desired impact. So I would like to ask the panelists, any of you who would like to respond, what are the best strategies for raising awareness of healthy food options uh, in our neighborhoods? And people don't have that information automatically. As a member of Congress, I ask you, what do you think are the best strategies for raising awareness of healthy food options uh, to our constituents. Okay, so I, I see Chef Nishan, Barbara Petey. Um, why don't we go in that, anyone else just raise your hand. It's, it says we're not in person. This is kind of like Hollywood Squares. So you just gotta, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta raise your hand. So we'll go, uh, with Chef, we'll begin with you. You, you have to unmute. You have, oh, yes, uh, thanks. You know. Um, uh, thank, thank, thank you, Congresswoman Norton, for for that excellent question. I think one one of the powers of uh, these interventions that we're talking about is it, it's you're really hard pressed uh, whether you're Haitian, Croatian, Appalachian, Laotian. It really doesn't matter um, when you see a doctor or healthcare professional and they give you advice. You listen. You really do listen. Um, I, I think, you know, one, one of the reasons why, why it's important to really have these types of policies embedded in Medicare and Medicaid, um, you know, and frankly, um, a, a policy environment that actually incentivizes healthcare insurers uh, and providers to take this approach with, with anybody. Incentives are power, powerful and uh, incentives are what really brings advice to life. It's one thing. Um, for a healthcare provider to tell somebody that they should eat better, 
and then let them out the door and not give them the financial resources they need or the information. Um, in many of these programs throughout the country and produce prescriptions, it's actually the nutritionist who holds the prescription. The doctor makes the diagnosis, really identifies that a patient is either at risk of a diet-related disease or has a diet-related disease that can be effectively managed um, through better nutrition. And the nutritionist has that $80 a month, which it, many of you know that in your districts, um, low-income families, $80 a month is a lot of money uh, for any food, let, or, let alone fruits and vegetables, the stuff that you can't afford. When, when a nutritionist who really can help somebody make a healthy weight plan, help them understand what within their culture is most accessible and available to them for that $80 a month, those shoppers pay attention. Um, back about eight years ago, there was a woman who wrote in the Nation uh, magazine online, uh, followed seven middle-class shopping families and seven SNAP families and found that the SNAP families were more sophisticated than the math that they did. They shopped in more venues. They were more adept at using coupons. They really knew what to do with the limited resources that they had. So imagine if these programs were supported by Medicare and Medicaid and those resources were available to this already frugal engaged population, regardless of ethnicity, race, uh, or age. Um, with that good quality information by a nutritionist, which is right now not paid for in some of these services. Um, that, that, that's a powerful opportunity. It really kind of changes the, the definition of comprehensive care. So I, I, I think, again, you know, what we're all suggesting here and being able to provide that support within the healthcare environment that links then back to food, um, you, you'd see some pretty remarkable results. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Petey, Ms. Pearl, Dr. Chen, and um, okay, and I, I, I thought those, those are the only hands I see. Okay, good. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chairman. I, I would just, um, you know, tag on to what Michelle said, and you know, I think this maybe addresses both of the questions. But um, it's estimated that hunger in our nation has a price tag of 160 billion, that's with a B dollars. And when you think about the implications of that 160 uh, lost wages, lost productivity, medical costs, not only to the individual, but to the industry. And we talked about the stigma, the, the shame that hunger brings. You could invest that 160 million into programs that truly do educate. We talk often about meeting people in, in their place and in their space. And I think along with policy that it could be universal as opposed to the you know one-off programs that are amazing and again successful, but what we really need here is policy. Make sure that as part of that policy, education is a focus. Make sure that you're uh, representing the cultures and the backgrounds of people. You can't go into certain communities and, and suggest one type of food if they've never tried it before. It has to be medically tailored, but it also has to be something that they're familiar with and comfortable and, and will try. So uh, one of the things that we really stress at the coalition is to make sure that the voices of those on whose behalf we serve are part of the conversation. I don't think there's anything um, more detrimental that we could do as we start to move forward in this than to say to someone, here's what we think you need. We need to listen. We need to educate ourselves as to what everyone needs and really make that a two-way conversation. We have three legs of the, of the stool, as we say, the coalition, advocacy, education, and research. And that education comes from the clients and the, the people in the communities we serve, and it also brings our best practices to bear. But I really think if we have a, a policy that could save money at the back end, we've said it so many times, it's the apple a day. Uh, when we first got into this work, we uh, learned quickly there was an adage that you could feed someone for a year or take care of them in the hospital for a day. Why would we not invest in the prevention and the, the work that we know can keep people out of the hospital, uh, away from conditions that exacerbate, reduce those chronic conditions, and and truly, you know, shift shift the care delivery model as we've talked so often. So just wanted to add that. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Pearl and Dr. Chen. Uh, this probably. Oh, oh my this probably won't surprise you because I am adding on to what my colleagues have already said. 
But there's a lot to be done on systems change in order to address the question um, that that um, is on the table. And we really do need healthcare to shift its focus and to ensure that nutrition is part of its focus, which it is not now. And so currently we don't screen for food insecurity. We don't refer if it is somehow brought up in a conversation. We don't treat with nutrition. The whole thing about good food and nutrition kind of stands apart. And we really do need to integrate into healthcare. So we need to change medical education. I think the last statistic I heard was that physicians in their training in four years get 20 minutes on nutrition. We need to change that. We need to influence how doctors view nutrition as part and parcel of healthcare so that they um, start to see not only diagnosis and um, prescribing of medications and other kinds of treatments work, but that they also look at the low cost intervention as so many people have already said. Uh, we need to structure for nutrition risk and importantly, because we hear from physicians and um, practitioners all the time that one of the reasons they don't screen is that they don't know what to do when they get an answer that I need help. So we need to make it easy to screen and then to refer so that people know where to send for help. So for instance, we're involved in something called the FNS, Food and Nutrition Services Bundle in New York City right now in hospitals where people are being screened for nutrition and then are being appropriately referred to food banks, congregate settings, grocery settings, or ultimately medically tailored meals, depending upon their medical situation. Um, and so once we screen, once we refer, then we're able to connect people through really strong uh, closed loop referrals that will get people not only deferred who makes the referrals will find out that the referral has happened, which will reinforce people's use of the system. And then ultimately, as I said earlier, but just do want to reinforce that we need to make food and nutrition interventions part and parcel of the healthcare system in Medicaid, Medicare, and the private market. Because without that, um, it's just never going to become the the practice guideline that it needs to become. Yeah, perhaps if we had some questions on the medical boards about nutrition that that spend more than twenty minutes <laughs> teaching. It. But in any event, Dr. Chen and then Dr. Williams. Congresswoman Norton, I really appreciate the question. How do we scale and do this work in various venues? And right now we are talking about healthcare, and I would say there is a healthcare strategy within the four walls of the clinics and the health systems. And then there's a kind of outside of healthcare strategy with, with all the partners, food, uh, farming, all of those pieces. Healthcare is at a moment where we need to have all hands on deck. It's not only getting nutritionists, it's not only the doctors, it's also the nurses. It's everyone, all hands on deck within, within the healthcare. We need to reorient our work. That is a mindset shift because that is not how we've been trained. And that is not where the incentives and how we are, uh, how we are to be recounted for in our work uh, lands. So we need to shift some of that. So all healthcare needs to stand up and actually leverage its might in ways that are actually multiplicative, a force, a force factor, because we know that food is a least, is a much less expensive option. If I can pay, if I can support my family a family of four with $650 a month for food, that is way cheaper than, way less expensive than an admission to a hospital that costs $17,000 a day because my patient has low blood sugar, right? So we need to reorient those uh, incentives to align us in that way. All hands on deck, nutritionists, doctors, uh, community health workers. And as we do that within healthcare, we need to get beyond our silo of healthcare to think, how do I partner with Michelle and the chefs? How do I partner with Karen and the food vendors doing the medically tailored meals? How do I partner with, this, with the community health workers and the promotoras doing the work outside of the walls of the clinic? How do I partner with the farms, like in our area, uh, to actually create a, a larger strategic plan where we're all thoughtful and connected in what we're saying? It is such a simple intervention that we've, we've forgotten in medicine. We need to reclaim it. Uh, every bite you had at lunch today, that sends, that tells your DNA 
to express proteins that are pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. Though you multiply, you multiply that over your life, you're going down the diabetes pathway or the health pathway. And so it's right under our noses. We just have to reorient everyone to do so and to actually have these larger cross-sector connections and intentional work. Everyone has done amazing work on this uh, panel, uh, creating and taking all the arrows from 20 years ago you know, to build these systems. How do we now thread it together under a larger rubric and a larger uh, data and evaluation structure um, to show and make the case? Thank you, Dr. Williams. Very briefly, Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Norton, part of what you asked was finding healthy options. So I, I'll just take that incentive idea one step further, which is partly helping small businesses, right, who can provide healthy food options. If we start to link, right, reimbursement in Medicaid and Medicare and ultimately to commercial providers as well, and they can therefore pay providers of healthy food options, right, to participate in programs. That downstream impact, not only does it have impacts on health and healthcare, it has impacts on our economy. And I think about Ward 7 and Ward 8 and the opportunity, right, to invest in those communities, right, and allow small businesses owned and run by people from that community, just like other communities across the country, it is more than just a healthcare impact that everybody has done an amazing job talking about. There's an economic impact in our communities that we also should be thinking about uh, as part of this. Okay, I that it? Okay, on this, okay, uh, Ellen, I'll, I'll go back to you. Oh, I'm sorry. Did, yeah. you, did you recognize me, Mr. Chairman? I did, yeah, yes. Because I did have one more question. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask uh, what steps the federal government should take. We, we, I'm a member of Congress. The chairman is a member of Congress. What steps should the federal government take to increase access to healthy foods in low-income neighborhoods? Who wants to take a crack at that? Uh, uh, Michelle and then Dr. Chen. You got to unmute. I know. I, uh, thank I do you. That all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I was a Saturday Night Live skit for a moment. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, the chairman's earlier recommendation of, of a, a broader roundtable that includes commerce, treasury, uh, small SBA, et cetera, is, is critically important. One, one of the things that's lacking in Ward 7 and 8, just, just like healthy food is lacking, is, is income and opportunity. When we look at... Um, you know, the, the new markets tax credit benefit um, that's been deployed now for, for a few decades, very powerful tool in triggering investment in low-income communities, but so much of it goes to housing because the tranches and the releases of the funds are so large and they're in the hands of institutional lenders like banks um, who really like to secure those loans with real estate. So I think you know, being able to look at the rules and the regulations around how new markets tax credits are deployed, it could be a very powerful add-on to the arrows in the quiver of the Small Business Administration to be able to provide loans to entrepreneurs in these communities so that they can actually provide a variety of food retail businesses based on the cultural preferences of the neighborhood that they live in. One of the things that we've learned with both nutrition incentives through the Food Insecurity Nutrition Incentive Program and, and the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program, as well as produce prescriptions, when you put money in the hands of, of a low-income community member that can only be spent on fruits and vegetables, um, if you happen to be Haitian and you can find bread, fruit, and kalaloo, you know what to do with it. You're going to go, you're going to buy it, and it's going to hit your kid's table. Um, easier to get that done than to try to teach somebody what to do with broccoli. Um, you know, and, and it's these local retailers, farmers markets, being able to use uh, value-added producer grants through the USDA to support urban farming uh, for the marketing, uh, for the infrastructure that you need to start a small farm business and to package your own goods and maybe open your own retail site. 
there, there are so many opportunities to de-silo um, and work between committees. There, there's something for everybody. Uh, and I think all of us here believe that the platinum ring is when you get agencies like Medicaid and Medicare at, at the size of the budget that they have and what they currently reimburse for non-traumatic limb amputations, diabetes, let alone the pharmaceuticals. But you look at these, these significant therapies are wildly expensive and that money actually goes to these local food retailers. You're improving the health care of all Americans, regardless of age, ethnicity, income, et cetera. But you're also providing significant economic sting stimulus to these food businesses, whether it's an urban farm, a small locally owned grocery retailer, a mobile market, whatever it might be. So I'm, I'm in favor of bringing multiple committees together to address this because it's not just going to happen in one policy. But I, um, the big one, I think, is Medicare and Medicaid and being able to code these healthy food choices as reimbursable and put those resources in the hands of the folks who are facing diet related disease. Because if they can spend their way by buying healthy food to avoid type two diabetes, limb amputations and dialysis, they'll do it. Dr. Chen. No, I would just say in terms of next steps, uh, number one, CMS uh, reimburses. Uh, for these medically supportive food interventions, food as medicine interventions, whatever we want to call all these interventions, um, that that becomes reimbursable. Um, and just the, the story to that is I work with all these clinics to adopt this type of work. Their budgets, their way of thinking is, doesn't have an ability to pay for food, right, to pay for this. So, so we're having to find grant money to do it, um, and that just is not sustainable. So got to make this permanent and reimbursable from a CMS level. Number two, in terms of actionable step, and I really like where the chair was going at the beginning, we need to bring CMS together with all of these other agencies around food, the USDA, whatnot, and create the strategy uh, towards how to do this. Um, how do we, we have, have we set the North Star? How do we create the implementation plan? Uh, from the questions that were asked earlier from Representative Scanlon on provider education or patient education, right? There is the setting up of network adequacy for um, food vendors and health systems to talk, to share data. Maybe this is where Dr. Williams would go. There are there are a number of steps and strategies uh, that need to happen, and then the whole implementation side of that. But you can't do that within just healthcare alone. You can't just do you can't do that within USDA alone. You have to bring everyone together, and that's really what I think COVID has taught us. We cannot stay in our silos for the good of the planet um, and for the good of our communities. Thank you. Uh, and I'm gonna to go to Dr. Williams and then Ms. Pearl and then Ms. Petey. Um, uh, but let me just say that we, we need to get the HHS to understand that they need to take a bigger role in this because you know, some of the modest, well, minuscule funding for produce prescriptions was in the farm bill. Right. That's way that's fine, right? But really, it should be uh, the responsibility not of USDA, but this is a health issue, right? So we need to get the department that really needs to oversee this to be more invested in this. So, so Dr. Williams, Ms. Pearl, and Ms. Petey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I was going to echo that, but take it maybe one step further. Um, so we have examples of risk-adjusted reimbursement in this country, right? In Medicare Advantage. We have codes and we we document and the sicker that somebody is, the more that we get appropriately reimbursed to care for that individual, but it's all clinically based. There are opportunities to think about risk adjusted reimbursement that's inclusive of both clinical disease, but also social risk. So that would allow for thoughtful, it takes into account all the reimbursement ideas that we've talked about today, but it also allows for thoughtful investment and for organizations to understand that they actually can get reimbursed to care for vulnerable individuals, populations, and communities. And so we love that uh, as an idea, I believe that they're, they're real opportunities, again, the right thing to do. The only second point that I'll make that ties into what everybody has just said is the SDOH Accelerator Act that starts to bring together um, all of the different um, parts of the federal government um, in a community where HHS, right, is, is a huge part of that, feels like a, an important step um, to be made as part of that. There's a second component that has $25 million in grants, right, that can be made to state and localities as part of that. 
Um, I would suggest that 25 million is a great start, but it may need to add additional zeros to that to have significant impact uh, as part of that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Pearl. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm you. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, I was going to start uh, where Dr. Chen started, which is about the silos. We must have cooperation across the government. I will not repeat that. I was also going to talk about what, um, uh, what uh, Michelle said about um, taking uh, food and nutrition and solidly placing it with primacy and then um, people really seeing it as a low cost, high impact intervention, because that is what it is and we need to do that. Um, but I also want to say that on top of all of the focus on food as medicine, which I am so grateful to this committee for focusing on now, there is also the question of equity. And if we want to solve some of the issues around equity in our society, we have got to think of food as being part of that solution. And that's why the um, necessity to go across all departments, it is without question, and I couldn't, I, I kind of want to, you know, take out pom poms and cheer you, Mr. Chairman, for saying that the health side has to be far more involved because they do. I think we've all agreed, we've all said it, that we must have Medicaid, Medicare coverage for food as medicine. There's no question about that. But also within that, equity has to do with who has access to food, who has access to food to create so, um, services in their community if they are food insecure. Um, is that food of good quality? We need to have a, a food system that produces high quality, healthy food, not just food that fills bellies. We need to do all the changes to integrate the clinical system with the social safety net system so that we have all of those healthcare providers finding out about food security, that we have departments funding food as medicine research, and that we are building out the data sharing that currently exists in silos within the provider community. So when we have contracts with health plans, we can't get complete data around what is happening to the client because some of it lives at the hospital, some of it lives at the health plan, some of it lives with us in the food provision. But what we really need is this kind of sharing so that we can get a look at the whole person and what are the outcomes. And so there's so much that we can do to change the system, but it really does at bottom. It is an equity issue and it requires the reimbursement for the food as medicine services. Thank you. I'm going to go to Ms. Petey and I'm going to go to Chef Diaz to see whether he wants to add anything to this. So, uh, um, Ms. Petey. Thank you, I'll be brief. Uh, I think a lot of the comments um, already stated, I, I would echo and um, was going to say myself, but you know, we're talking about a lot of money and I think the more we incentivize um, food as medicine programs, the greater health outcomes we're going to realize. I can't stress enough the uh, cross agency collaboration as we're working on this policy. We are a cross sector organization by intention so that when we come to you to talk about what we need, you don't think it's just from healthcare or it's just from insurance or it's just from business. We've kind of taken that step out of the process. I think likewise policy needs to be drafted um, with that mindset and intentionally understanding the, the effect on different agencies. You know, human beings, as we all know, are not designed by departments of the government. It's not left arm Department of Education and right arm uh, transportation. And so these are very basic human needs we're talking about. And what we quickly learned as we established root cause that the cornerstone was indeed food insecurity but to focus only on food insecurity, you are missing a lot of other issues. And so it becomes whack-a-mole. And when you start to address food insecurity, you're going to lift up and, and start addressing the other issues as well that so many of these agencies are held responsible and accountable for, and ultimately improve the overall health and well-being from a transportation, from an education, from a housing, from a nutritious stand, nutrition standpoint. So um, we need to come to you from a cross sector um, perspective, but I think that this policy needs to be written, obviously, from a cross agency perspective with HHS at um, the head. So just wanted to add that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, I, and that's a good point. I mean, look, the reason people always ask me, why is the Rules Committee doing these hearings? Um, and the reason why is because we don't have the jurisdictional constraints 
of a lot of other committees. Um, so if we were on agri on the ag committee, we'd be talking about SNAP, um, and then we'd try to few throw a few other things in there. But you know, school meals is under uh, you know education and labor, and, and and so I think my colleagues will all agree people get really touchy around here if you encroach on their you know jurisdiction. Uh, but you know we're able to take a more holistic uh, view. I mean, so I mean, food as medicine is is a central part of what needs to be highlighted, and we want this White House conference because all hands on deck. I mean, there's a role for the Secretary of Transportation, a role for the Secretary of Energy, a role for the uh, you know Secretary of the v uh, Veterans uh, uh, Affairs. I mean, you name it. There's there's a, everybody has a role to play, and we need at the government level. For the president to say, okay, everybody focus on this and, and show me what you can deliver uh, and what we where we need to move. And we also need to engage the private sector and the nonprofit sector. Uh, and we need to highlight the innovation. So let me let me yield finally to Chef Diaz Diaz if, if you want to add anything. Well, you know, you hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, Chairman, you know, McGovern, we're our hospital here is even located in a in an opportunity zone and somewhat of a food desert as well. I mean, we deal with this <clears throat> as a county hospital with uh, with our patients every day. Um, you know, we have three retail spaces. We welcome everyone, you know, from the public to come and uh, and and partake in the food that we offer uh, at, a, at a at a great reasonable price, uh, affordable pricing. But uh, you know, there's Things that we have to address, <laughs> you know, that's all been touched on already by by many of my colleagues here. But California alone, you know, loses uh, fifty thousand acres a year, uh, you know, of its agricultural land. You know, about thirty nine thousand of those acres to urban development. How long are we going to wait to address how important food is to to everyone? The diversity, equity, and inclusion issue in opportunity to address it, it's it's in everything. Food is in everything. It touches everyone in every profession at least three times a day. And I'll be I'll be uh, I'll say that sometimes it touches me five times a day. I include ice cream as a as a course. But the point is is that if we don't, I guess how long are we going to wait? Um, until we ha is it going to be until we have to import much of this food and uh, and realize uh, to realize its nutritional value, you know how are we going to sustain as a as a human race, right? Thank you very much, and Eleanor, thank you very much uh, for your questions. Let me just say for the record, I I when Eleanor mentioned that we had uh, toured part of her uh, district together. And, you know, when you walk into a supermarket with Eleanor Holmes Norton or walk down the street, it's like walking uh, with a rock star. Um, she's more popular than the sales uh, at the supermarket. And uh, people roll down their windows and, you know, sh shout her name out. So, uh, but there's a lot of good innovation happening um, in some of the challenging parts of, of her district. Uh, the question is always sustainability and how you ramp it up. Um, and so uh, I, I thank you. I thank her for being part of this hearing. I now uh, I'm going to yield to my colleague from California, Mr. Desanye. Thank you, Mr. McGovern, and um, thank you for visiting my district as well. It's a wonderful visit. I, I am not Eleanor, I will admit, including in my district. Although I, you were pretty popular, I got to tell you. So right. well, I selected the site, so it might have had something to do with it. Um, I, I just want to tell you all how much I appreciate this, and Mr. Chairman, truthfully, um, your your leadership. This is, uh, pardon the expression, cross-pollinates my two careers, having been in the restaurant business in, in the East Bay in San Francisco. Um, I'll date myself. I can remember as an owner of a restaurant that's now a Montessori school, higher and better use on University Avenue in Berkeley having discussions with Marianne Cunningham, the James Beard's co-author, and Alice Waters and Robert Mondavi about their vision um, 40 years ago about changing, particularly California, to a more Mediterranean uh, culture of a relationship with where we get the food and the value of what we put into. And I have to say, I, I can remember telling Marianne, this is never going to happen, and I was wrong. Uh, Wonder Bread is not the staple of California's diet. 
So Stephen, let's talk a little bit about our experience here in California. And to uh, Chairman McGovern, I think this should be a big part of the conversation. I think we can talk about our successes and best practices and in the integration of public health, uh, agriculture, and climate change. All of these things converge. And as a member of the Education Labor Committee and uh, chair of the Subcommittee on Health, um, and having worked with the former CEO of Safeway on this, Steve Bird, who was sort of a pioneer, but we had some difficult discussions in his contract negotiations uh, with the retail clerks um, about how he changed as a, as a large private employer who was a very large distributor of food um, to a more um, informed decision-making and the opponents of that. So what I was a co-author of the first menu labeling bill with now U.S. Senator Alex Padilla and how much the food industry uh, fought us, very much like the tobacco industry has fought us. So all of us in public health and what we did uh, in the East Bay, um, I think is indicative, but how Congress facilitates those opponents. So if you look at uh, Stiglitz's work on this, how they take their, their private sector risk and transfer it to the public sector, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, public health, but where they use it uh, on agricultural subsidies, on educational subsidies. And I, I personally, to Eleanor's comments, I think the two things we could do best is to really illustrate with you best practices that we've developed in this country and Europe already had and Asia in many ways has had in their dietary and their agricultural relationships, but then also stop supporting and subsidizing. And I know this is a political problem uh, in the Midwest and other parts of our constituencies, but we've I think he froze, hold on, all right. Don't you love modern technology? <laughs> oh, yeah. Give him a, we'll just give him a second. I think he's going to try to come back on. Technological COVID, I'm telling you. I know. I just. Uh... Let's get an update to make sure he's. Well, while, while, while we're waiting for him to uh, to get back on, let me uh, let me let me tell you. Oh, here he is. Okay, good. All right. I was about to stretch for you. You know, I don't, I don't know whether it's President Putin or the food industry <laughs> there. But let me just finish with best practices and and um, Stephen, maybe you could respond our experience in the East Bay and in California, um, these how Congress can um, both help convening the cross-jurisdictional issues, which you've talked to at length already, but also um, best practices from local um, perspective. And I know there are many of them around the country that fit the communities, but since you and I both live in the East Bay of the Bay Area and we have some history on this, and then the other part is how do we stop subsidizing bad behavior when it comes to, to health, um, whether it's uh, free and, and subsidized in California now, completely free, thank you to the leadership of the governor and the legislature for uh, young people in school, or whether it's a SNAP program, um, we should stop subsidizing bad behavior. And, the, and what we've seen in the soda industry and the things we did uh, to the soda industry, I think is quite remarkable. To the fast food industry in the East Bay, we started looking at advertising close to schools 20 year, 25 years ago. Uh, land use decisions to the last comment that we wouldn't allow fast food restaurants or convenience stores within a mile of middle schools uh, because we knew that they were doing that deliberately. So I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, we can really, I, I really believe we're at a real crucial point. I'm so grateful for this discussion because we can bring this to scale and, and really address generationally 
multiple public health issues, including climate change. Thank you very much for the question, um, Congressman Desaulnier. Uh, let me speak to one about best practices, and then let me speak to the the, the piece around subsidies. Um, I would say from a best practice perspective, we have some local examples that we, you and I are aware of. Uh, we've, in the Alameda County, have adopted a good food purchasing policy. Right? All county agencies have an opportunity now to purchase food that's grown sustainably, uh, humanely, et cetera, gets points for that. It becomes a pathway um, that creates a demand uh, for this type of food. Then the question is, how do you then bulk up the supply? So our, um, our circular food economy element of our work has gotten 90 acres of land at Ardenwood Farms to grow the food to meet the supply um, and the demand, or to grow the supply and to have the demand. So one is a policy piece, but that's that's kind of, and that's overreaching and local. Um, you ha We have in California soda tax approaches, right? Legislative uh, approaches, policy approaches as well um, to kind of speak to the second piece around subsidies. But I think that every, as, as we do this work, overarching policies like good food purchasing, um, we need to continue to think beyond health to education, to farming, all of them to, at the same time. And then what are the policies that allow for all of them to be working in synchronicity? The second piece is a really important one because, and this is something that I'll say as, as a doctor, right? When I talk with my patients, it's one thing to say, eat more vegetables and fruit and to do the right thing, exercise and all of that. But if their food environment is filled with processed foods, added sugar to the tune of 90 pounds of the extra a year that we consume, added salt, then it's really hard. There's a lot of noise in the back. So, you know, from a medical perspective, I have to do the both end. How do we detoxify, if you will, reduce the entry of all these added uh, sugars, processed foods, and at the same time promote the best practices for the available options? If I only tell people to detoxify or to reduce subsidies and I don't have an alternative ready to give, then I fail. If I only talk about eating the right foods, getting the right exercise, and I don't have implementation strategies to support that, and I don't uh, play defense and really reduce the influence of all this background noise, then I fail. It has to be a kind of all hands on deck, multiple uh, approach strategy. I don't know if that responds enough well to your, uh, what you were asking me to respond to, um, Congressman Desalinier. No, that that's great, and I, I appreciate it. And I just while you were speaking, I and, and I realize this is happening all over the country. So I, I forgive me, Mr. Chairman, if I'm being a little parochial, but we have some history here that I wanted to share, both to celebrate because we've done remarkable things, I think, um, nationally, uh, but also to point out how we don't have to recreate the wheel. But I think the other part about our opponents um, is much successes we've had this transfer of private risk in the food industry to the taxpayers and public health uh, that, again, as Stiglitz talks about his writing from an economic standpoint, I think you do a cost benefit. When we did the menu labeling bill, uh, we worked with, um, I think our public health officer was Dr. Jackson, um, who wrote books about land use and public health, if you remember. Um, and w when we presented the bill and we were, we were we were, they were being lobbied, uh, our, our, our colleagues in the legislature, fairly heavily by the food industry um, not to support it. When you looked at what they were telling the public, the uh, investment community about McDonald's need for growth year over year, and we put that in the context of our population and demographics, particularly poor or risk people, it, they couldn't have the growth with their menu and the consumption on the financial side without diabetes and obesity. So I, I, I just think, uh, Jim, I'll, or Mr. Chairman, I'll end there, but we really need to look at what, to Eleanor's question about what Congress can do to stop incentivizing bad behavior by subsidizing industries that transfer their costs then against the tax. The taxpayer pays for them to create the product they do to be consumed, and then the taxpayer pays for the public health remedies, not to mention the moral obligation to help American citizens live free, long, or long and healthy lives. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for indulging us. And uh, thanks again for coming to the district. I appreciate it. 
being a translator for the Boston accent, the Worcester accent in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, well, thank you very, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I, I just have a few questions. I know people have been here for a long time, so I want to try to, I'll, I'll try to get right to, to the point. Let me, let me first thank you all for for um, for being part of this panel, and um, and this is one of many panels that I think need to focus on uh, food as medicine. Um, you know, one of the things that um, kind of has frustrated me over the last few years, especially when I've seen some of the innovative things um, that have gone on um, that many of you are responsible for, is when I go to a, a you know a, a hospital or a school or um, you know or some other entity and say you know hey look you know they're doing this in California or they're doing this in Massachusetts or they're doing this in Washington D.C. you know what what let's all do it and you know the the answer is usually oh yeah no that's a good idea yeah no I'll look into it and then when you push them it's kind of like there's a resistance to changing the status quo. I mean, because we've been doing something the same way forever. Uh, so like, you know, if this was such a good idea, why didn't we do it a long time ago? And there is this mindset, um, you know, I've seen it in the medical field in some of our major hospitals, you know, I, I, you know, I've seen it in schools, I've seen it in so many different, I've seen it in government where, you know, we, 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 we've been doing it this way, let's not change it. I mean, um, you know, uh, you know, when I was uh, out in California and I, I met with uh, Chef Diaz, I mean, I, I, th I thought this, what you're doing is really kind of innovative and, and good. I mean, we want people to eat when they're in the hospital. We want people to think the food tastes good. It, it, it's not just a luxury. It's like, if food tastes lousy, you're not going to eat it. You're not going to get better. Um, teaching people some of the skills on how to prepare good food when they go home um, is important. Uh, and yet, what seems so obvious, and what you have done, is 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 not is kind of almost unique right now. And so, how do we overcome that mindset of like, you know, change in this area is a good thing. You know, it's the world will not come to an end if we do things differently. Um, you know, uh, you know, I was I, I met with uh, when I was in Arizona, I met with the. Uh, the Hopi tribe that were um, that were that that uh, you know that we you know we're, we're trying to come up with ways to fund efforts to improve health and nutrition at their local hospital, but they're struggling, right? I mean, uh, not so much with how to create uh, what a, a a healthy tribal diet, but with how to get things up and running and identify funding. Um, and so let me begin with, you know, Chef Diaz, I mean, what, what, how do we, I mean, as we wait to get government to buy into some of this stuff, how do we, how, especially in areas that are not located in places where there are big donors, right? I mean, there are big donors in New York and Massachusetts and California, but some of these other places, it's not easy to identify somebody who will help underwrite some of these programs. And maybe you might want to comment on that. Uh, yes, and, and thank you, Chairman. You know what we're doing here is 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 I'm not sure if it's completely unique. Um, you know, it, it's we're trying to push for something, but uh, whether it's our UC health system here in California as a whole, or when I talk to chefs, say in the main medical center in Portland, Maine, um, or smaller hospital. Uh, you know, the CEO over in uh, at Clinch Memorial in Homerville, Georgia. We're all trying to do the same thing, uh, which is interesting, right? And uh, although we may be a little bit further ahead, what we've been doing is using the argument of, of um, well, taking the sustainability route, right? Waste. You know that we have a hunger problem in this nation, yet if 55% of our average uh, uh, patients in our in our hospital right now that are within our care for an average of 6.1 days um, are not on any special diet and are on a regular diet. Why are we serving them a low sodium meal, right? I know the answer is because, of, you know, it's cheaper to the labor issue and the food cost issue. It's just easier to just serve one meal that can blanket across multiple diets. 
that's how you get to the stigma of hospital food when you've just broken your arm and your food does is bland, colorless, and tasteless, right? So what is, what is, this, what is the hospital really doing to solve that? So that's where the buy-in from leadership to push and say, that's a problem. And, and, and if I'm just gonna highlight it and say, yeah, it is a problem. And we spend X amount on the 2.4 million meals that we provide annually on this problem that's going into the, the garbage, literally. So how can we create change for that problem? And so if they put it on my, you know, my position, my, my space to just say, okay, is it a menu engineering issue? Is it an opportunity? You know, because it's not like we have unlimited resources and funds. We have budgets, right? So we got to engineer a menu that can actually be accomplished with the labor structure and models that we have, right? And education through that. Um, and so, yeah, that, that waste issue has been a big, big, big opportunity. Thank you. Before I go, I know Ms. Pearl has to leave, and so I don't want, I, I want to give her, get, let her get a last word in. Let me just say, I, I love God's love we deliver. Um, and I love Mana when I visited that with, um, with Representative Scanlon. I have community servings in Massachusetts, who I love as well. Um, but I, I love it. I, and I said this in the beginning, I'm going to say it again. Not just because you're providing good, nutritious, tasty meals to people who are in need, but the dignity in which you do it. Um, the volunteers are incredible. But um, it is it is really it is really wonderful. As I mentioned earlier, I was at the Institute for Family Health in Manhattan. They do a lot of work with you as well, and I um, and I just you know and and again we are uh, the, the medically tailored meals part of this. We, we we this there's no reason why this can't be advanced. And I'm sure Dr. Williams will. I mean, you, we all have. We said we need more data. We got we got we got data coming out of our ears, right? Showing that this works. I mean. You know, when people say we need another study, more data, it's like that's an excuse to do nothing. You know, it's, and I just, I, it's just enough. We know, we know enough. We know this works, um, and we know the connection between food as medicine in general. So this more studies, give me a break, right? But anyway, I want to give you a, an opportunity to say a few words before I know you have to go. So the floor is yours. And you got to unmute. Yeah, okay. You have to unmute. Yeah. Unmute. There we go. Uh, there we thank go. you very much for that. I really, um, you just said what I was going to say in a far more direct. I was going to try to clean it up a little bit, but we are, we're, we have pilot fatigue. We have prove it fatigue. None of that is working. We really do, as you just said, um, Mr. McGovern, we've got to say we know it works. Doesn't mean we, there's not other research we can do to more finely hone populations and amount of food people need over what period of time I get all of that, but we know it works. It's time to make the change. It is time to really get um, food as medicine. And I speak for the medically tailored meal world, the medically tailored meal intervention acknowledged and part and parcel of our healthcare delivery system. I have no better way to say it. I said at the beginning, we will never achieve our healthcare results without that. I told that to be true. And I very much appreciate what you just said, Chairman, about um, the dignity and the respect that our clients deserve and that they, um, that this food needs to be seen in the, very much the same way that they see all the other kinds of healthcare that they might get, that it comes from respected and renowned practitioners who are part, who are helping them to uh, have a care plan and helping them to achieve their healthcare goals. The only other change I would point out, um, and I know that this is a tough one, is that savings do matter. And the other place that we always get to the point of like throw everything away, like you said about, you know, we don't need another study, we know it works, is we can't count savings. Well, we need to start counting savings because what we're talking about is a very low cost, I said this earlier, highly effective intervention that saves so much money and that results in people being healthier and feeling better and more active and more able to engage in the world. So we have got to start to convince um, Congress and all of the agencies that create funding opportunities and regulations that savings really do matter and that you can spend a ton of money on the next medication and a ton of money 
on the next diagnostic machine or approach. But really, food as medicine is going to truly revolutionize the system at a much greater um, cost savings with great health outcomes. And prevention really matters. Treatment matters through food. Um, and that is work that collectively we're all engaged in. And we really, at least I very much, I think we all very much appreciate the opportunity to talk with all of you in the committee about this so that we can, in fact, move forward on, on that effective change. And, and, I, and I think your point about savings is important because if people, are, if members of Congress are not moved by alleviating human suffering, which we'd like to think is a priority, but if you're not moved by that and it's just the bottom line, I mean, the evidence is here. And um, so we have had a conversa initial conversations with CBO, the Congressional Budget Office. We're going to have another conversation with them, trying to help them understand the research that exists, the data that exists to prove beyond any doubt that there were savings here in a 10 year period of time. Um, because, quite frankly, you know, we shouldn't have to be looking to offset programs that provide net savings. And so we're, we're working on that. It's, 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 it's tough, but we're, we're going to continue to work on that. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. And if I may, just one other thought, uh, just to follow up on you said, we're not even looking at things like education, which obviously I firmly believe in, which takes a lifetime of the child. Food is medicine, at least medically tailored meals. I think many of the other programs represented here have positive outcomes, health outcomes in three to six months. Right. Like savings can be counted now for now. So, which is a, a, a thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And um, you know, my staff tells me that I've kept everybody too long, but I want to go around to those who haven't. I want to give you all one last chance uh, to uh, kind of put on the record what you think we should put on the record. But uh, Ms. Pearl, I know you have to go, so thank you very much. So uh, why don't we, be, Ms. Petey, why don't we begin with you? We can go right around and get everybody's final thoughts. And uh, uh, again, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Congressman. And uh, again, I can't stress enough how much we appreciate your leadership and I'll just underscore that we are with you every step of the way. Anything we can do to help make this White House you know, summit a reality, I think it's imperative when we discuss with people that there has not been one since 1969, that it's kind of jaw dropping. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of things have occurred obviously between then and now. Uh, we do have the will to do this. We have the tools to address this. I think if we can help build that political will and, and help you make the case, then we are all in. But I think to go over um, everything that's been said, just underscore it, and you said it, let's let's do it all. We uh, we didn't know what we were capable of doing 18 months ago when this pandemic first set in. And I think we've shown resiliency in ways that we probably never imagined. Um, I'm sure we wouldn't think we would be attending congressional hearings in various rooms of our homes and offices, but this has been really important dialogue. I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it. I'm honored to be with my colleagues, but, um, this is one step and we are with you through the entire process. So please let's not give up. Well, thank you for your, uh, your contribution today. We really appreciate all of your work. And again, I, I mentioned this before we began the hearing, but I'm going to mention it publicly now. And that is we have 25 chairs uh, in the House of Representatives. All 25 chairs have joined on a letter that we have sent to the White House asking for this White House conference. Uh, the Speaker of the House has been supportive of, of this effort. So, you know, the political winds are aligning. Um, and again, uh, you know, I, I, I think this is gonna happen and we're gonna certainly need your help uh, uh, to help design this conference in a way that it is all that we want it to be. Um, Dr. Williams, why don't we go to you next? Thank you so much, Chairman. Just to summarize a few points that, that have been made. So first of all, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, I would say that the, the other five representatives and their colleagues around the country have demonstrated, have proved, as you all have said, that this works. So one of the most important uh, things as we think about this work is addressing this is solvable, right? We talk about that a lot. It, this is a solvable problem. So it is an education activity. So I think there are two things. One is an education activity to eliminate the barriers that that stop people from doing this work, which is it's solvable. There are models out there. There are best practices that exist, and this can be done. The second thing I would say is much of that work has been done in spite of the incentives, not because of the incentives. And so as we think about changing that incentive-based model, reimbursement models around that, 
paying less for heads in beds um, and more for outcomes related to individuals, people, populations, and, and communities fundamentally uh, is part of the solution um, that has to become part of that. So as we, as I think, despite being an optimistic uh, entrepreneur, I'm also cynical at times and think about fear and greed, unfortunately, that drives so much of the decision-making process. The great news about it, even though this is fundamentally 100% the right thing to do from a human standpoint, this is also 100% the right thing to do from a bottom line standpoint for our country, for businesses out there. And to me, that's what allows this to be accomplished. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chairman. Chef Diaz. Um, so I was taking notes on, on everything. It's about risks, right? So whether we want to talk about uh, reducing the risks for our economies, farmers and ranchers, and using the forecasting that we do as an institution, a food, a food procurement institution, and using those forecasting numbers and futures for them to be able to plan. Much like right now, we're in the we're approaching fall. Next spring, I already have our organic farmers identified for asparagus here. They know what to plant. We reduce their risk. What is the risk of what, what happens when we don't do these things, right? So we risk our nutrition security, the topic where we're dealing with or talking about right now. Uh, the fact that good food is good medicine. You know, food is medicine. You know, this is what we're talking about. You addressed it yourself, but it's the, the data is there. You know, it's the beat the deck, right? And we're just trying to figure out what how to move on from this. Uh, so the financial benefit, and it depends on what the acreage is, uh, lost acreage here in our state, you know, uh, for agriculture, how much, when is it going to be too late, right? Uh, we need to address this now. And so uh, proactive educational opportunities, um, you know, surrounding food nutrition, you know, all this play a role, you know. And so with that, thank you, um, Chairman McGovern, for uh, allowing me to speak on this, this important topic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen. Thank you so much, Chairman uh, McGovern, for inviting us here, for taking up this topic. We in Alameda County commit to working with you on this work. You are taking that meta level lead, which is uh, profoundly important to move beyond sectors and agencies. And so we welcome you to Alameda County anytime uh, to come and visit as well. You asked the question that I've been thinking about. Uh, you said, we're gonna hit a lot of resistance. How do we then spread and scale this? And I would offer two principles. Um, the first one is you go with, you segment out and you find out the people who are early adopters, those who have the energy, the passion to do it. And you marry that with the equity lens. Where are those folks doing it? And of those early adopters, is there an equity piece there such that if we can support those communities who are already resilient in doing this work to do it, we know that this will scale into all the other communities. Those two lenses put together bring business practice where you go with the segmented early adopters with an equity, which we do in government so well, with the people who are already suffering the most but are also the most resilient. You combine those two, we can find those hot spots in the country to grow this and create momentum. I would say then that that leads to this question of listening to from an equity perspective our communities. And when I, as a, as a doctor, listen to my patients, I'm listening to them and saying, what does this patient need on the spectrum of their medical conditions? Be they end stage, they're in the hospital in, in, um, in, in UC Davis with Santana suffering, or they're in the clinics with me with early pre-diabetes, way before, 20 years before they're going to end up in Santana's hospital. How do I listen to that and then match the appropriate spectrum of food interventions and behavioral and support interventions to that. So yes, we have Karen's work with me medically tailored meals. We have Michelle's work with produce prescriptions. We have uh, produce boxes. We have food pharmacies. We have a variety of, of work that's being done. How do we listen with an equity lens, with a growth lens, and then uh, play the field, if you will, and, and move this together? So I leave you with that. And I, again, appreciate everything that uh, this amazing group of people have done and are doing and look forward to for, for future partnerships. Thank you. Chef Deshaun. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, again, appreciate the invitation and really appreciate the time of the committee members uh, and, and their, their obvious passion uh, to support these types of concepts in this work to see a scaled new reality where, where all, all Americans, regardless 
of the social determinants of their station in life can just exercise their right to feed themselves and their family well. Um, to, to your question, and, and um, I think Trenor mir mirrored it as well, um, beyond everything and all the great work that each of our organizations do, everybody that's participated in this, this um, important conversation and beyond, you know, we, we talk about the incentives and making the resources available to the patients, but, um, you know, a big part of this answer and being able to deal with the detractors is, you know, that value-based care, um, you know, by working closely, I think, with doctors and insurers to create the types of financial incentives within the systems uh, that actually reward people to keep their patients healthier as opposed to the myriad of other ways that they're paid now, um, that, that's something that can be addressed through regulation. Uh, I mean, that, that whole notion of making sure that there's a win on the other side of it um, for these um, actors and players in the system to behave better. Uh, it, uh, you know, they're, um, being able to save money over 10 years is one thing to convince a person, a, a member of Congress, but a lot of these folks are looking at quarterly returns. When I think of, you know, Santana's conundrum, um, you know, with the amount of waste in in medical meals, it, the talking to the Treasury about how community benefits reporting requirements allow a nonprofit hospital to keep their 501c3 status and scoring it based on um, the quality of experience that patients have in their meals, the, the nutritive quality of the meals, and the amount of meals that are actually served and consumed. All of these hospitals are perfectly capable and already have the infrastructure in place to measure it and to report on it, making it a requirement for them to be able to maintain uh, their community benefits status, uh, I think would be a really powerful incentive. Incentives and disincentives are two of the key things that we've heard about today. Soda taxes to prevent people from making the unhealthy unhe choice, healthy food incentives to make a healthier choice. Uh, science proves that the combination of both incentives and disincentives in the same environment are a powerful economic tool, they're a powerful behavior change tool, and I think they apply uh, for these insurers and these healthcare providers, as well as the recipients and the beneficiaries of the program. And, and again, I think, um, you know, congressmen and, and committee members, your vision and and bringing together multiple agencies to have these conversations to figure out what that magic um, combination of incentives, disincentives, and then the right approach through rules, regulations, and legislation could be. Um, we very well could be looking into the short distance future to a new food reality for millions of Americans, and, and wouldn't that be delicious? So thank you all for your time, uh, Congressman McGovern, for your amazing work, and, and uh, I will yield. Well, let me again thank all of you for uh, all of your time here today. You know, hunger, uh, food insecurity, nutrition insecurity, they're all political conditions. I mean, that's just the fact. Uh, and, um, you know, we have the resources, we have the food, we have the knowledge, we know what to do, right? It's, the question is, do you have the political will to do it? And, um, you know, that old saying, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, that applies to systems. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we have to think differently. Uh, there needs to be systematic change uh, in our healthcare system, but in a whole bunch of other systems as well. Um, and, you know, there's a role for every department and agency, a role for every committee in Congress, a role for every sector in our country, whether it's the public sector, private sector, state, local, nonprofit, you name it. Um, you know, th th there's a role to be played here. But if we get it right, Right, if we get this right, you know, you prevent human suffering, you save a boatload of money, you know, maybe we could, you know, and, and, and maybe we get to the business of rather than saying we can't provide care for this or this or this because it costs too much money to the fact that is that we are saving money in the system. Uh, and so we don't have those terrible debates. Um, and, um, you know, uh, it was mentioned, Barb maybe mentioned it at the last conference we had similar to this was 52 years ago it was when Richard Nixon was president. Now, my first job in Congress was working for George McGovern, no relation. And so, as you know, he lost to Richard Nixon, but he, um, he headed up the select committee on nutrition and human needs. 
in the Senate, working with Bob Dole in a bipartisan way. And by the way, Bob Dole has been very supportive of the efforts that we have been doing here today. And um, and McGovern talked about seeing a documentary in I think it was 1968 on CBS called Hunger in America. And he um, watched it and saw uh, it vividly hunger in America. And he felt ashamed, he said, because he was a United States Senator um, and didn't realize the extent of hunger in America. But we fast forward all these years um, and here we are now. I mean, I, I people come to my office who are hungry. Um, I go to hospitals, I talk to doctors who tell me about senior citizens who are in emergency rooms because they've taken their medication on an empty stomach. Um, I visited tribal communities in Arizona talking about the high rate of diabetes, all diet related, and yet they still haven't figured out how to you know, provide people with the kind of food that could prevent that. Um, you know, there are hungry kids who go to school. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I share what George McGovern felt all those years ago. I, I feel ashamed. And I think we're at a moment where maybe um, the stars are, are aligned, where people are starting to think a little bit out of the box and bigger. And thanks to your leadership and 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 the public statements that you have made, the 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 examples that you have, uh, you know, helped produce. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's a little bit of wind at our back, and so we are going to do this White House conference. I'm waiting for the president to give us the okay, um, and when he does, um, I'm, I expect to be working with all of you to kind of develop the food uh, is medicine component to it. But uh, I really enjoyed this uh, panel uh, a, a lot, and, uh, and this is a helpful addition to the volume of material that we'll provide the White House. So with that, the Rules Committee is adjourned, and everybody be safe and have a good day. Thank you.